serpents and innocent as doves. And uh, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapters 10, 11, and 12. And so a couple of years ago, we actually started the Sermon on the Mount. We took a, you know, several weeks, a couple months to unpack the Sermon on the Mount. And then we came up with another series after that that was called Follow, that followed everything that happens. And Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount and said, this is how you're called to live. And then he went out and demonstrated and lived the example of what that looked like to live out the Sermon on the Mount. And now we're picking up that continuing story in the book of Matthew as we go forward. And now Jesus is calling the disciples back to him again. So he gave instruction. He lived it out for a while. Now he's calling him again for instruction. He's getting ready to send them out as his ambassadors. Uh, as his uh, representatives out to do his work. He says, hey, I have some additional instruction for you. So that's what we're going to be looking at. And uh, as, the, as the title of the whole series indicates, some of the things that Jesus says in this passage are, are they're confusing. When, when you read it, at face value, you just kind of look at it and you're like, man, I'm not sure I get that. I'm not sure I understand what Jesus is saying here. This needs a little bit of uh, unpacking and interpretation to really understand how to apply it to my life. But my hope is, as we go through this, that we'll be able to understand the things that saying, we'll be able to apply it to our lives and live them out in a daily basis. We always want to go from knowledge in the head to knowledge in the heart to knowledge in the hands. Right? Where it gets in our mind, it gets to capture our heart, and then we live it out and we apply it. That's always the goal. And so as we begin this opening section, what we're going to look at today is um, some things that are, Jesus is going to say that it, it's one of those things where you step back and you're like, man, am I supposed to do that? Is it, 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 does that apply to me or was he talking to somebody else? And we'll get into all that, but what I really want us to see is that it begins with a firm foundation, that if we're going to seek to follow Jesus in the world, we've got to start with the right foundation, and it all centers around him. And so what we're going to look at today is how we've got to reflect Jesus' heart, uh, the, the, the foundation of everything we do has got to flow out of the heart of Jesus that he has for the world. We're going out into the world, we've got to see him through the eyes of Jesus. Uh, we're going to look at the authority that Jesus has given, and everything flow out of his authority. And then finally, we're going to look at the humble example that he said, that he was humbly obedient to the Father, and he set the example for us, and we're going to follow after that as well. So we'll see all that kind of come clear here through the scriptures. Uh, but if you haven't already turned there, I want to invite you to turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 10. And we're actually going to begin it um, just a little bit earlier, Matthew chapter 9, the last few verses of chapter 9, just to set the context and the stage for where we're going. Uh, with this. It's really important. It's something that Jesus does in chapter 9. Uh, it's really important for me to get into chapter 10. Uh, but as you, as you guys turn around and get there, um, I want to ask you guys, do you ever, uh, you guys remember the whole WWJD bracelet thing that happened a few years ago? Some of you guys might still be rocking those, or you might have them, right? But, uh, but it's the whole thing. What is, what is WWJD? Anybody shout out? What would Jesus do, right? And it's, it's great. It's like a principle that, like, man, if you just live your life in every instant said, man, what would Jesus do right now? Uh, you probably wouldn't see yourself wrong too often, right? But in talking to people over the years, I've heard people say, yeah, but Jesus was the son of God. <laughs> you know, he was uh, perfect and sinless. Uh, he also had the ability to walk on water, and he did all these amazing things. So, man, if I was Jesus right now, I would probably just head off across that lake, because I have that kind of power, you know what I mean? Like, so people sometimes are like, yeah, yeah, I get it, I know that's the Sunday school answer, but that's not practical for me. I'm not Jesus, I'm never going to be Jesus, so how can I do what Jesus did? And I want to acknowledge, like, yeah, that's, there's, there's some reality in that, that, that sometimes those sort of, uh, they, those answers sound patterns, right? It sounds like, oh yeah, sure, yeah, okay, just do what Jesus did. Well, that's not working for me in the real world right here right now, right? But I want to look at this and say, yes, we do need to do what Jesus would do, but I want to help you to understand it in a way that's really applicable to us as broken, sinful, fallen people who need, who need help in those areas. And so we're going to begin in uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. It'll be up here on the screen, but you can follow along in your Bible as well. Uh, it says this, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. So we're going to hang out here for a minute, and we're going to begin here just with this idea that if we want to go out into the world, if we're coming to the Bible and saying, all right, Jesus, give us your instructions so we can go out into the world and we can make a difference. The place that we have to begin is with Jesus' heart of compassion for the world. Why do we want to go into the world for the first place? And what we 
we see here in this passage is that Jesus looked at the crowds that were gathered with him. They heard about the miracles. They heard about the healing. They were desperate. They were sick. They were dying. They were hungry. And they said, this man has the answers. I don't know everything about him. I don't know what he's all about. Uh, I just want what he can give to me. And Jesus looked at him and said, yeah, of course. Of course you do. You're desperate for the answer that I have that I can give to you. And so as we go out into the world, the first thing that we need to question is, what's our motivation? Are we trying to accomplish something for ourselves? You know, are we, are we trying to prove ourselves right? When I look at arguments that go back and forth on Facebook a lot of time, that center around religious things, it's, a lot of times it just seems like two people that are trying to prove that their side is right. right? And so many times that the motivation doesn't come across as compassion for a broken person, a uh, sheep that's lost without a shepherd. It comes across as, I'm right and you're wrong. You either need to get on my team or you can get out of the way. And so we got to begin with this sort of heart of compassion that Jesus had for the people. And what do we see here? What did that compassion lead him to tell us the to do? What was the immediate response of having a heart of compassion? It was to pray, right? He said, he said, look at these sheep. He didn't say, get out there and do something. He said, pray to the Lord of the hearts that he would send out laborers. It began, when we have a heart of compassion for people, it's going to lead us into a place of praying for them, praying earnestly for them, praying that God would send someone to bring the good news of hope to them. Not that you guys have ever noticed this, but uh, within the Christian culture, sometimes things can get a, bit, a little bit competitive, right? And so uh, uh, it's, it's not a good thing. It's not something we should be proud of. Uh, but there's uh, about a bazillion different denominations, right? And if you meet somebody on the street and they say, you find out they're a believer, you start talking to them the next while, you're like, oh, where do you go to the church? And the question you're really kind of asking is like, hey, what team are you on? What, uh, what subdivision of Christianity do you exist in? Do you share my views? Do you, do you share the things that I'm kind of really focused on? And I, there's an extent to which that's a good thing, right? Because we want to know, are people actually followers of Jesus? Or are they just culturally Christian? Were they, when they say they're a Christian, does that mean, oh, I was raised in a Christian environment, and I still kind of go out of habit, and uh, I'm kind of worried that if I stop going, bad things are going to happen, and like, so, so I'm kind of superstitiously just kind of continuing to attend? Or do they mean, man, I've come to realize that Jesus was the Son of God, and he offers me salvation and hope and forgiveness, and, and I'm pouring out my life to follow him. So, so we want to ask some questions to kind of get into that that range, but but more often than not, Christians uh, can become really divisive over, over the different little suspects, and I think God really desires for us to be far more unified than we are. And, and we see this as a church plants and churches, a church that desires to plant churches, what we find is that when we start going into a community and we want to say, hey, we're sending a church planter into this neighborhood, uh, what kind of reception do you think we usually get from the other churches that are kind of already in that space? It's not usually a good one, right? Um, oh, there are exceptions, right? There's different, there's different things, but a lot of times the, the response is, well, why do we need a new church here? Uh, we've got a church here. Maybe they should go somewhere else where there is no church. And I think the reality is that we've got to embrace this. Like, well, we're here this morning. There's roughly 200 people here, give or take, right? In the Horsham census uh, in 2010, the population of just Horsham is 26,000 people. Okay, and I know most of you guys, almost none of you actually live within the Horsham Zipco, right? So we're coming from a greater, much greater region than that. So if we've got a Bible-preaching, gospel-centered, Jesus-focused church uh, that's right now ministering to about 200 people in this area, how many more churches would it take even just right here to reach this population? So the problem is sometimes our focus is not on all the lost sheep that, that need to find the true shepherd. It's not me. <laughs> True shepherd is Jesus, right? So the lost sheep that can be pointed to Jesus. Uh, but our eyes are rather on, okay, how can we uh, gather the people that are already Christians, that are already believers, and our worry is that another church comes that's a little bit cooler, it's got a little bit better programs, it's got a little bit better facility, it's new and fresh, and people are going to stop coming here, and they're going to start going there. And we're just worried about the shift that happens, right? But, but that's not the essential thing. The essential thing is reaching the lost. So we have a heart for that, so... Um, when we find out that our church plant is here in the area, we try and go out of our way to welcome them and say, man, we've been praying for the Lord of the hearts to send laborers into the harvest, but we are so glad uh, that you've come. And so there's a 
Presbyterian church that I know is trying to be planted right here in this Warminster worship kind of area. And so when we found out about it, Brian and I we took him out to lunch and said, hey, tell us about your vision. Tell us about what God's laid on your heart. Let us know how we can help you to get something going here so you can reach people who aren't being reached. I was at Starbucks the other day. Um, well, every day, but. <laughs> but the other day. And um, so uh, the girl there said, hey, what's your name? I said, Ezra. She said, oh, that's a good good little name. I was like, yeah. I was, I was like, you know, somewhat prophetic. My parents said I ended up becoming a pastor. She's like, oh, she's like, my husband's a, a church planner. Uh, you know, I'm like, oh, oh, that's awesome. I gave her my card. Like, you know, I'm thinking about the lunch sometime. Let me, let me talk to her. And, and I'm so glad that God's called your family to come into this area and plant churches. Like, we need that. We need to have that heart as a church to say, we welcome everybody that's here to proclaim Jesus. We, we're glad for that. And not only do we welcome them, but we're actually praying for it. We're praying, God, send more people into the Philly region to plant churches, uh, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus so we can see his name grow. Amen? So we've got to deal with that heart. And if our heart's not there, it's usually a reflection of the fact that we haven't prayed for it. And then something really cool happens here as we get to go into chapter 10. And this is why I wanted you guys to see this. Jesus says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, and therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. And then in chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, it says this, And he called to him his 12 disciples, and gave them authority over them, spirits to cast them out to kill every disease and every affliction. And so he said, hey, pray for laborers to go out into the harvest. And then a few minutes later he said, hey, guess what? You guys are the laborers. And you're the answer to your own prayer. And so for some of you, you might be praying, man, God, I have such a heart for the teens in this community. I see the teens are, are just wandering away from you, and I go to the mall, and I'm kind of afraid. And I, and I, you know, I want to see you do a movement among the young people. Maybe God puts out on your heart to pray about that, maybe he's preparing you to be the answer to your own prayer. Right? There's a lot of times where it works out where you see a problem in our church, you see the problem in your community or in your family, and you're like, man, I wish somebody would come along and be an answer to this, help solve this. And what I want you to see here is a lot of times God puts that on your heart because he wants you to begin praying about it, and he wants to show you sometimes that you're the answer to your own prayer. Or if someone else is the answer to the prayer, if you're already praying and when they come in, you can say, man, I've been praying for God to send you. What can I do to help you? How can I encourage you in what God has called you to? Let's continue on here. Uh, chapter 10, verse 2, picking up after he says this. He says, of the names of the twelve apostles are these. First Simon, who was called Peter, Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector. James the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who was a traitor. And uh, as we're learning more and more to recite, this list of names are like really important. There's only so much to glean out of this. There's, there's so much that we can take away. But the, the central thing that I really want you to see here is that they operated under the authority that Jesus had given to them. And the same is true for us. That if we operate in any sort of authoritative way in this world, it's because Jesus has blessed us his authority, but it looks a little bit different for us. So let, me, let me pull that apart and explain that a little bit. The word that's used here uh, is exousia, and um, I may not be pronouncing that right, but trust me on that. Um, and it can be translated either power or authority, so depending on what translation of the Bible you have in front of you there, it might say that he gave them the power to do these things. Other translations can say the authority to do these things. Uh, this is the same word that was used at the end of the Sermon on the Mount when the people were in all of Jesus, and they said, they were all of him because he spoke as one who had it's that same thing. So they were like, wow. He's not just saying, here's what Scripture says. He's like actually speaking Scripture to us right now. Jesus had that sort of authority. And then it's used again. Uh, Jesus forgives a man and heals him. And, and, and the Pharisees were really freaked out about this. And he said, hey, if you may know that I have the authority and that I have the power to forgive sins, I say, get up and walk. Right? So, so Jesus was given authority from the Father to come to earth things. And now we see that he's giving his disciples that same authority. And so it's this idea of, of being a representative. It's like when the disciples, when the apostles said something, when they walked into a town, it was as if Jesus had walked into that town that it, that it carried that kind of weight and position. You know, we hear in the Bible uh, or in ancient times about, you know, the king's reign. The king gave his reign to someone. It was like he was giving his authority to them. Whatever they did, it was as if the king had done it. 
was selling. I ran into this uh, challenge with authority one time, and uh, I've told the story before, so I apologize for those of you that have heard it before, but uh, I grew up, uh, you know, I was in, in college in the 90s, and it was really cool to go to the thrift shops and eat clothes, and some of you guys are still living in that, that age and era, right? But, um, so I went, and I got this really awesome security guard jacket, right? So it was like an authentic, it, it was black, and it, and it was cool, and it was vinyl, and it had this cool like, security guard patch on it. And in the 90s, there was like no sweeter sport that you could have got for like four dollars. So, so I got it. I'm wearing it. I'm in this highly unsuccessful rock band with my buddies from college, and and we're uh, we're playing at this like tiny little bar that only had like four people in it. And uh, so we go in there and we're waiting around to get started. And uh, all of a sudden, this guy comes up to me. He's like, "Where'd you get that jacket?" And I was like, "Yeah, it's awesome. It's like, I got it at the Salvation Army." And this really goes like, "You didn't get that at Salvation Army." He's like, "That security company. That's my father's security company." And there's no way that that would ever be at uh, a Salvation Army. And so he was really angry. He was like ready to fight me. He thought I had stolen this jacket and stuff. And so I was like, hey, man. I was like, I, was like, I honestly, I probably still have the receipt. I too. I got it from the Salvation Army. But I only spent four bucks on it. And it's that big of a deal to you. And you're really giving it. So I took it off and I handed it to him. And it was cold. So this is a big sacrifice. But <laughs> so I gave it to him. I walk away. And I go over to somewhere else. And my friends come over to me. like, dude, what? I can't, I can't take your jacket. jacket. What are you doing? You can't just back down in. I was like, oh, listen, like, it, it's, it's a big deal, man. It's not that big a deal to me. Because I understood that he wasn't worried about the value of that jacket. He wasn't worried about the price tag that came with that jacket, right? He was worried about that badge that was on there. It represented his father's company. It had authority that somebody wearing that jacket would have access to get into places that the only people who had that could get into. He was worried that I was operating under authority that I did not deserve and had been given. And I understood that. And so I was able to say, hey, listen, I get it, man. Take the jacket. It's okay. And then later on, he did come up and shake my hand and say he's sorry. So it's a happy ending to the story. <laughs> but the thing that we see here is that Jesus gave them this powerful authority. Now, the question is, do we have the same kind of apostolic authority today? Do I, as a pastor of this church, have that sort of apostolic authority that what I say is as if Jesus is speaking it to you. Well, no. Okay? Uh, within limits. What I say that comes out of God's word, what I say that comes out of the Bible, out of the New Testament that we get, this is authoritative. This is where our apostolic authority comes through today. And so the opinions of Ezra, of the stories and the judgments of Ezra are, are worth about as much as, 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 as they're faithful to this. Okay? And so I there's this succession that happens where God gave authority to Jesus. Jesus passed over to the, the, the apostles, and the apostles recorded it for us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. And so we do come with authority of Jesus, but it's grounded and it's based in his word. And this is where our authority comes from. We have to understand the source of our authority when we go out into the world. Because one man's or woman's opinion is no better than the next man's or woman's opinion. It just depends on how well educated or researched they are. Those, those things come and go and ebb and flow. But our faithfulness to God's word is really important. And this is an important thing for us to grasp in our heart because uh, going all the way back to the early church father, Arrhenius, we dealt with this, we deal with this today, that people will say, well, I like Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. I want to do the stuff that Jesus did. But I don't really like Paul's theology very much. I'm not really into, you know, he said that, that Jesus had to die for our sins as a, as a sacrifice, as a substitute. I don't really believe in, uh, that Jesus had to die. You know, that God couldn't have made his son die. That just doesn't seem right for God. So I'm going to reject all the, the stuff that Paul says and Peter says and John says. But I'm just into Jesus. That there's not a father that would save us today. And it's just, for one thing, it's logically inconsistent. Because we're coming to the same source. How, how can you come and say, well, I believe the recording of what Jesus did. I mean, how do you know what Jesus did apart from what his apostles told us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, right? So, so when we pick and choose which parts of the book that we're going to agree with, then what's the highest authority? It's us, right? I become the highest authority. I decide this part's good, this part's not good. I agree with this, I disagree with this. So it's really important that when we go out into the world, we sit under the authority and the cool thing about this that, that we see just briefly in this list is that we don't get a lot of details about a lot of these guys, but the, the details that he does include is Matthew, a tax collector, and then he talks about uh, Simon the Zealot. The kind of fascinating thing about this is that a tax collector at that time was aligned to 
himself with the Roman Empire. He was a representative of Rome. And so he was a total traitor to the Jewish people. He was saying, I'm going to take a job with Rome, and I'm going to use it to my advantage, and I'm going to oppress my people on their behalf. Whereas the zealot was on the far end of the spectrum. They were the one that could not stand the Roman oppression. They were fighting and battling against it. They were trying to raise up and have an insurrection against the Roman Empire. And so we have two people that are politically, ideologically as far apart as they could possibly be, and yet under Jesus, they come together. They're united. They're able to, to serve under him. And they didn't become these like passive robots that no longer had faults or ideas or, or leans or feelings, right? They probably maintained a lot of those, those gut instincts and those desires. Simon Zelda still probably hated the Roman Empire, but he learned how to process that through the love of Jesus. And so he did it in a different way. So I want you to see that when we operate under the authority of Scripture, that it's a very uh, leveling playing field that, that, that everyone is invited. It's so ultra inclusive that everyone is invited to come under the Lordship of Jesus and to move forward. And so uh, there's no second class system. Power. So we see we've got to be the heart of Jesus, his compassion, which leads us to pray. We've got to have the authority of Jesus. And now we get into Jesus' instructions to the twelve as he sent them out. And this is what he says in verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructed them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead. Cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without pain, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your wills. No bag for your journey. Or two tunics or sandals or a staff. For the labor who deserves his food. Whatever town and village you enter, find out who is worthy in it. Stay there until you depart. And as you enter the house, read it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet, for you leave that house for ten. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. So there's a lot of things in there that are kind of, uh, that take some processing for us, right? If we were going to uh, not look at the Bible in context, if we were just going to look at a verse or two at a time, we'd be like, oh, wow, I guess we should cancel that trip to Brazil, right? Like, we shouldn't be going there. We shouldn't be going to any town of, of Gentiles or, or anyone. We should only be going, we should just plan our relationship to Israel, right? We should only be preaching and teaching uh, and trying to get to the people of Israel, right? And, and there is a place, certainly, that's something that we're called to do. We see throughout Scripture that uh, God's heart is full of the people of Israel and desire for them. But really what we see here, the reason that Jesus is explaining this is that Jesus is calling them. He's saying, in this place, in this time, in this moment, come on mission with me. Do the things that I'm doing. And when you go through the Gospels, what you see is that Jesus was very clearly called in his time on earth to minister to the house of Israel. That he was called to come to them first, to make the way of salvation known to them first. And then after they had rejected him and crucified him, uh, then the Holy Spirit came, and then we received the command to go into all the nations, right, and to baptize him. And so it was greatly expanded at that time. But there's encounter after encounter in the New Testament where, where Jesus comes to somebody and the Samaritan woman wants something from him. He says, hey, don't you know I'm sent to the house of Israel. I'm not, this is not your time right now. She says, well, even the dogs can get scraps off the table, right? And so Jesus was saying, hey, my ministry right now is to the house of Israel. So right now, I want you to do what I'm doing. I want you to go to them, to these people specifically. This is what I want you to do. And we see that Jesus' ministry was healed with with a lot of miracles and casting out of demons and, and these things accompanying him where everyone, there were signs of his authority and his power. So he gave that same command, that same authority to his disciples. Uh, does it mean for us uh, that, that our goal needs to be going out and, man, the only way I can be successful is by continually casting out demons and healing and doing these things? Uh, you know, we can read these things and be like, maybe I should be doing that. And here's what I would say. I would say, God can do whatever he wants. I don't want to put any limit on him. And many times when he's bringing the word into a place where it has not been yet heard, he would use signs and wonders and, and powerful things to show that he has the authority to do it. But after a time, the people kept coming to Jesus and they said, show us a sign, show us a sign. On the cross, they said, come down on the cross and then we'll believe you, right? There's a point where Jesus says, hey, I made the way clear. I revealed myself. It's now it's time for you to either receive or reject the truth. 
So know that God can heal. I can see you pray for healing. I've been struggling with sickness for the past two weeks. And trust me, I've been praying for healing. And God has chosen to miraculously heal me in an instant from that. And I know it pales in comparison to what so many are going through and so many have gone through. But I pray with faith knowing that God can heal. Um, that's not always the way that he chooses to interact at this place in time. He doesn't always bring you to healing as a sign of his power in these moments. We, we have to understand that and accept that, that Jesus is ministering in a specific way in this season. The big point that I want us to see here is that Jesus is calling us uh, to minister in the way that he ministers. So one important piece that he points out here is that he says, go to the outsiders, the sick, the dead, the left, the demonized. Go to the demonized. Go to the ones that are on the margins of society. Go to the people who society has rejected, and I want you to bring your good news to them. That's something that we need to take forward. We need to say, yeah. How are we reaching out to those? You know, you know, that's why I was excited to be a part of this Act Now thing. Who are those who are being Oppressed in our, in our society and our culture today, how can we be a part of it? helping those people? Because that's what Jesus' heart is to do. He also says that these kind of conflicting things. He says, hey, you receive without payment, give without, without expecting any kind of payment. So I'm giving you power to heal and to proclaim good news, go all these things. So don't go into town and set up shop and say, all right, 100 bucks ahead, I'll give you whatever's wrong with you, right? Like, don't use this for, for your own advancement. For your, this is for my glory. I gave it to you. Be a good steward of it. And then he says, as he comes to the end of that, the laborer's worthy of his wages, that the laborer deserves to eat. And he says, hey, the people that you care for are going to in turn care for you. But I want you to, to receive dependence. I want you to learn how to depend on me and rely on me and believe that I'm going to provide for your needs. That's why he says, don't take extra stuff with you. Don't gather a bunch of rations and, and kind of gather out extra money and extra staffs and extra shoes. If you don't need all that stuff, just go out and depend on me and trust me. I will provide for you. So we've got to have this heart of, of depending on him, or we continually rely on him in that way. The other thing we need to see here is that not everyone will accept you. Not everyone will accept Jesus. Not everyone will accept his disciples. And not everyone is going to accept us. So when we go and we proclaim the good news, if we go into a house and we proclaim it, and people receive it, then we cast that peace on them. If they, if they don't, we let the peace return to us. And we just continue on. We don't linger. But he says something that I'll mention here in closing. It's, it's very challenging. He says uh, that when you leave, you should shake the dust from your feet. This is what the Jews did when they left the Gentile region because it, there was uncleanness, right? So they would, they would shake the dust and brush the dust off. And they didn't carry any uncleanness with them. He says to do that. He says, truly I say to you, it will be more bearable the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. And so this is really harsh warning here at the end. It says, hey, when you bring the good news to you, the good news to the kingdom, this point, they were proclaiming, hey, God's about to do something amazing. Repent. Get, get your ready. Get your heart right with God so that when he reveals himself, you're ready to hear it. And then we know that Jesus went to the cross and he died. But then he rose again in victory over sin and death. And, and, and now it's forgiveness and a way that the Father has been made. And so we have the fullness of the gospel to proclaim. He says, when you go and proclaim that to people, if they hear it, they reject it. And that's one of the most horrible sins that you to, to see who Jesus is, to know who he is, to hear about it, and say, no, it's not for me. We should pray, not for those people. Right? That, that it should return to that heart and say, man, uh, that, that breaks my heart that someone would hear the, the freedom and the truth that's offered to Jesus and reject it. And so, as we process this, in a lot of ways, this, this sermon is setting this up for everywhere we're going to go uh, in this series. That it begins with a very specific and Yeah, I mean, 